Hello. It's actually a coincidence. I'm wearing the same shirt as that photo, so it doesn't happen every day. But beyond thrilled, excited to uh, speak with you today about a topic that I know applies to everyone here, which is hiring and recruiting. Um, people are the most important part of every business, and so it's a, it's a bold title. I'm going to try to go through some tactical examples, details about how we've approached uh, building team at Gusto, and through that, hopefully, some of the lessons are useful to all of you. Um, but just to give you some context on Gusto, uh, we call our product the People Platform, so people are important to us in many, many ways. Uh, the core of it is payroll. We do a lot of other things around that related to employee onboarding, health insurance. Um, and so that gives you a quick capture on some of the examples I'm going to go through. And then from where we're at today, um, it was alluded to earlier, but we are thrilled to have over 500 people in the company. Uh, that's because we have over 60,000 customers today. And it's our honor to serve them. Uh, for those of you in the room, it is a privilege to make your life easier. A stat that we track pretty, uh, pretty much obsessively is NPS. And we have an NPS over 70, which means we're on the right track. And then we launched about five and a half years ago. Um, but to go into the topic at hand, um, you know, I was thinking a lot about the prompt, and no one really ever wants hiring to, to break down or you know, degrade as you get larger, right? It's, it's no one's objective. So everyone wants hiring to stay strong. Everyone wants there to be the same intentionality and deliberateness and thought put into when you're hiring your fifth employee as your 500th or 5,000. So why doesn't it happen that way all the time? Why does it break down? Um, there's no silver bullet answer, but I'm going to share some examples. And as I was going through those examples, um, there came to mind a bit of a framework. So I'm going to share that framework with you guys. Um, the, the framework is really just to imagine something you're doing around hiring, whether it's how you run your interview process, how you make offers, how you do reference checks. Imagine doing that same exact process or structure at 10x the volume and try to figure out what in your current approach would keep working and what would stop working. And as you think about that, um, then think about what you really want to fight to protect, what you think is super important to keep. And not the exact way you do it, but the philosophy, the ethos, the mindset behind it. And then when you have that, whether it's around how you make offers or some of these other examples I'm going to go through, um, codify it. Try to create an artifact. Try to create a practice. Try to create some way to isolate it down to the few sentences or bullets on what makes that unique to your company. And then make sure that it's not something you own as the individual founder. Um, because as you get bigger, you'll become very much a bottleneck. And so make sure that it's a shared responsibility. So that's kind of the framework. And the pitfall as you go through that is to make sure you're not just maintaining something for the sake of it. So it's not just keeping it exactly the same way because you've done it that way before. You should continuously reaffirm that this is the best approach for that specific topic. Um, and hopefully, some of those core philosophies stay the same regardless of what size you are as a company. So the three examples I'm going to go through, um, one I already alluded to, which is around offer calls. Uh, the second is going to an interview we call watermelon interview. I'll explain why we call it that in a minute. Um, but it's very much focused on things like values alignment and motivation alignment. And then the third is uh, hiring committee, and just sharing some tactical examples about how we've set up hiring committee at Gusto, uh, the way it works. And through these, I'll share some internal materials as well. Hopefully, it gives you guys some, uh, some research to look through. Um, and then I put a picture here of a tradition I won't be spending very much time on in our discussion. Um, but it is a tradition at Gusto that's quite quirky. Um, we do take our shoes off in the office. Uh, yes, all 560 of us. It's because we started the company in a house in Palo Alto. As founders, we were all raised that way. These are my two co-founders. And so simply, in a very organic, natural way, it just became a part of how we work. So if I have one tip on traditions, it's not to be overly, don't spend too much time on it. Think about just what develops organically and naturally and then let it ride. It doesn't have to be something that you plan out in a very extensive way. Um, but diving into offer calls. So if there's a universal philosophy for us, or a guiding philosophy, rather, for hiring, it's that we think about it as alignment. Um, you know, companies don't convince people to join them, and candidates don't convince companies to hire them. Both parties are searching for alignment to figure out, can we go do something great together? And that's, that's a pretty universal truth, in my opinion. And so if you think about this funnel that I just drew here, um, you have the whole world at the top, then you have all the folks that have heard about your company, uh, perhaps applied for a job, or folks that you've gone and tried to source to apply for a position. And then you have this whole funnel of interviews, conversations, reference checks, um, work sessions, et cetera, to figure out, is this a person that we want to have join our team? 
And so when you get to the end of that funnel, you probably spent hundreds of hours, you probably had dozens of people involved in various ways setting up the potential for you to go fill this role. And so at Gusto, we've always viewed from day one the act of making an offer as a celebration. It's this incredible, exciting moment where we've done all of this work, all of this investment in that funnel to reach this moment where now we've found someone who's actually aligned with our values, aligned with our motivations, aligned with our skill sets, needs, and now could actually do something incredible here if they choose to accept the offer. And so with this mindset, um, the way that we did offers early on at Gusto, this is the original version, then I'll walk through the scaled version, was, um, well, obviously the whole company interviewed every person because there's only five of us, six of us. Um, we were all working out of pretty much one room. So when we did the offer call, we didn't have conference rooms. We all joined the offer call. That made sense. And so we all would, you know, cheer, celebrate, yell, be really excited because we had found someone that was now connected to our, our mission, our values, our philosophy, and we thought could join us and do really great work here. And then we each wanted to share why. So we each went through and just talked for a minute on you know, something that had come up in the interview that that person at Gusto felt really connected them with this candidate, that they wanted to tell them why they were so excited to have them potentially join us. And then after we did that, I would go into either the hallway or a closet or something and go through the offer details and have more of a private conversation with the candidate um, to go through the rest of the offer. And so that was how we did it early on. The way that we've scaled that um, is that we obviously have hiring panels, so we try to be pretty deliberate on who's going to be involved in interviewing for a specific role, what perspective are they bringing to the table. Most hiring panels would have anywhere between five to seven people on them. And then when we do the offer call, it actually has stayed fairly similar, uh, and we plan to keep it this way, where um, the recruiter will, before we make that offer call, send an email to say, are you free to have a 30-minute you know, conversation, um, and then put a smiley face. We try to elude that something's good is going to happen. There's going to be a positive message. Um, we usually try to get it down to three to four people from the hiring panel join for the call. And the person calls in. Um, the recruiter says, you know, great to talk with you. Um, you have some other folks in the room. And it's because we're thrilled and excited to make you an offer to join Gusto. And then literally everyone just starts cheering and yelling. And so because we're hiring quite a bit, at our office today, you'll hear different conference rooms just explode in cheers at various points in time throughout the day, and we know that an offer was made. And so um, that's continued, and then we go around the room with those three to four people, and they each share one or two personal anecdotes, specific things that they remember that are very distinct and unique to their conversation with the candidate from that interview about why they said yes to giving this person an offer. And then after that, the hiring manager and the recruiter go through the actual offer details in a more one-on-one um, -on -one context. So uh, I wanted to share that with you as kind of a first tactical program that applies to everyone here and give you some context on how we approach it. Feel free to um, treat it as a celebration if you don't already. It really does feel like a universal approach. Um, second kind of tactical program uh, that I wanted to walk through related to hiring is the watermelon interview. And uh, you know, really, I mentioned earlier, our philosophy around hiring is it's about a search for alignment. Those are really along three dimensions. So values alignment, motivation alignment, and skill set alignment. Um, all too often in companies, people tend to focus on number three only, which is you have a specific need. Maybe you need someone to do back-end development, you hire a back-end developer. Um, or you need someone to do performance marketing, go hire a performance marketer. Um, I found that the first two are the ones that really can make or break hiring as you scale. Um, the third matters. So if you only hire for the first two, uh, you have cheerleaders in your company. So you need to make sure you fill a need with a specific skill set. But um, the first two are the ones that early on I would really focus on in the interview process. And just to give a little bit of color on both, um, values, uh, the way I describe it, are really not um, ever black and white. So every company goes through a process to figure out what values they're authentic to. They should be opinionated. At Gusto, it's a small number of values. And if someone's not a good fit with your values, they're not a bad person. It just means that they could do probably better work somewhere else. Um, and then motivation alignment is really about do they care about the problem you're tackling? And is it something that they instinctively and naturally and authentically resonate with? And again, if someone doesn't resonate with the problem you're tackling, that's fine. It just means that they're not going to be a great fit, at least in our case for Gusto. So what we did originally, um, well, I interviewed every candidate up to about 50, 60 people. And that was, that was the interview I did. Uh, we didn't have a name for it, but it was 
always about values and motivation. It was a conversation, it was very casual, it was very much an exploration of what drives someone, what excites them, what interests them. Um, it was back and forth, I would share more about what excites me, what drives me. We would choose something random, it might be, um, actually one I did last week, like, you know, a person's doing a renovation project on their home, and we just talk about it. And through that, I get a sense of, well, how they approached other people being involved, how they made a decision on what should be done or not done. You just get a sense of someone. There's no black and white answer to these questions. It's just getting a sense of how they think, how they work, how they collaborate. And so when we got to about 50, 60 employees, um, it wasn't going to scale for me to do that interview. I figured out a few other people inside the company who I knew could do and naturally did a very similar interview. And we had them basically jump in. And I would just make sure on every panel there was at least one of the three of us um, doing this type of interview. And so that was kind of in the early days. Um, at scale, uh, obviously, even that was not going to work, um, given the, the rate of growth. And so what we did when we got to about 100 people at Gusto was, was try to formalize this program. And the reason why we called it Watermelon is another inside kind of quirky tradition. Um, everyone joining Gusto gets a watermelon in their first week. And the reason why is when we hired our first employee in that house in Palo Alto, we had a watermelon in the kitchen, and we gave it to him. And so we just keep doing that. <laughs> so again, traditions don't have to have a lot of purpose or thinking behind them. They just resonate or don't, and people like to eat watermelon at Gusto. Um, and so we called it the watermelon program because it was a word people were very familiar with. Um, and so what we did was, with the program, now it had to be much more formalized. It was going to be a 12-month commitment. We were going to actually put some principles around this specific interview. And we wanted to have people be nominated. So it was, again, for Gusties. Uh, peer nominations were a big part of it. People vocalizing interest. It was going to be a couple-hour commitment every week. And we were going to do a bunch of training, et cetera. So we went through a whole process of filtering, narrowing it down to who would be a good fit. Um, we did a half-day training with those folks, which I'm going to walk through the materials with you guys around. And then uh, every candidate at Gusto, since this program was started, basically does a watermelon interview. And it's usually with someone that's not in your department or even in your part of the company. And so it's just now a part of our hiring panel. What is the watermelon interview? Is someone assigned to it? And it's actually the first scorecard I look at in the hiring committee. So sharing some of those materials with you, uh, just to get more tactical. Um, this is the kickoff that we actually use for the process. Um, it's, uh, again, really about helping us hire in a scalable way around values and motivation. Uh, a different benefit to it is actually it also created a community, these watermelon interviewers, people that are very invested in the way that we hire and build community and think about adding folks to the team. And they've actually kind of flourished in their own way, sharing best practices, tips and tricks with each other over the years. Um, and in terms of the actual... Uh, journey that someone goes through. The workshop is about a half day. Um, from there, we actually have them do three shadow watermelon interviews with someone who's already trained and practiced in doing that interview. Then we do three reverse shadows where they take lead and someone listens in and is able to give them feedback afterwards. And then from there, they graduate from the program. We give them some swag around watermelon stuff. And then they become a watermelon interviewer. Um, and like I said, it's kind of on top of your normal day-to-day -day job. So we try to keep it to a couple hours a week. It's generally a 12-month commitment. We're now in our third uh, cohort, or batch. We're kicking off our fourth one in the coming month. Um, and it's definitely a program that we plan to keep in the, in the company for many, many years to come. Um, we go through some examples here of what the interview is like. Um, again, it's a quite different interview. So when our recruiters um, brief candidates before they come on site, we go through the entire agenda for the day. In particular, they'll walk through that you're going to have a meeting or an interview with someone. We call it you know, the watermelon interview. Um, it's going to be much more of a conversation. It's going to be super casual. Ask a lot of questions yourself. Get to know the interviewer. Learn about what drives them, excites them. And this is kind of how the interview ends up going. It's very much kind of a ping pong, uh, or sometimes I describe it as um, channeling your inner kind of five-year-old, where you actually just ask why. And there's no right or wrong answer. You're just trying to get into the weeds a bit on the motivation, the thinking, the thought process behind the way someone approaches the topic you're discussing. Um, this is a tactical example here of how we guide folks doing the interview. So the interview itself has three parts. And then there's the prep you would do before, and then the debrief you would do after. So just walking through those. Um, prep, we really want 
uh, people on the interview panel to spend time looking at the candidate before, usually in the morning or the day before, get a sense of their background, get a sense of their experiences. Um, since you're not actually very familiar usually with the role or the department, you want to get familiar with the position, the job, because again, it's a role that is in a different part of the company. And then you want to get a sense of what specific questions you're going to focus on from the question bank. Um, now, as a part of the interview, uh, we ask everyone to introduce themselves. And this is where it really is a two-way street. Um, you know, the candidate's also evaluating the uh, interviewer as well. And it's actually a really great experience. We have many debriefs after this with folks once they accept offers. And this is usually one of the favorite interviews they have in the company because they're talking to someone that is totally unrelated to their actual day-to-day -day job in the company. And so they usually learn a lot about a different department, a different uh, way of, of how Gusto operates. They get a sense for why that person joined the company. And it actually ends up being uh, pretty compelling for helping them understand the way we work as a business uh, and also increases the chance of them accepting the offer. Um, the attributes of Gusto, and again, these are not universal. I would say every company should spend time to figure out what is very authentic to them, what's opinionated to them in terms of the way their culture, their team operates. Um, for us, these are the four that shown very brightly. And uh, just to dive deeper into the service mindset, we give the interviewers basically these different scorecards to calibrate what would be a positive indicator against this dimension, what would be a negative indicator, and then a lot of role playing and practice is how folks hone in on the ability to do this interview successfully. So as one example here, um, a positive indicator for service mindset would be when talking about motivation, really focusing on the customer. And in our case, talking a lot about small business, talking about employer-employee relationships, talking about frustrations they might have had, reasons why they want to go make that better. Those are all things that speak to a desire to be of service to others, which is really important to our culture. Uh, and then in closing, um, obviously giving the person a chance to ask questions, make sure that uh, it continues to be a two-way uh, street. And then evaluation, you know, this is for the ATS we use. We have folks submit scorecards and um, really try to do that day of in the evening to make sure that the thoughts are captured uh, as quickly as possible. And so the outcome of the watermelon interview, which you guys just heard about and got a really quick snippet on, is that um, I really do feel and I am proud that that same focus on alignment for three dimensions, but in particular values and motivation, uh, exists in the company today. Uh, when I do uh, workshops with new hires, I ask them why they join, and it definitely comes up every, every time I have that conversation. But it's not me in that interview, right? It's actually dozens of other Gusties who have been equipped and care just as much as I do to focus on these specific topics. And then the other outcome is um, hiring committee, which I'll go through real quick. So hiring committee is uh, something that many companies do. I think you have to create your own version of it for your business. Um, you know, the goal, above all, is to maintain a, a very holistic, consistent approach to hiring. And in a fast growth business, which is, which is again, abnormal. If you look at how companies have grown and, and what the normal rate of growth is, it's very abnormal to have teams growing 20, 30, 40, 50, 100% year over year. It actually creates a lot of unintended consequences. And one of those is that usually you have a lot of first-time managers. And so it's easy if you don't have a more holistic, integrated way to think about hiring to have different dynamics develop and actually have different cultures or different um, approaches get created in your company, which can be counterproductive. So it's really about creating a more holistic, common approach. And then number two, um, one of the best outcomes of hiring committee is it actually is a chance to share feedback and help managers get better at hiring. So a big role that we play in hiring committee is giving very tactical advice to people um, so that they can get better when they bring candidates to hiring committee to make sure that they get approved as an offer. And again, the way we did that originally was I just was in every interview. That is not scale. So hiring committee uh, at Gusto, our version of it is made up of four people. I'll walk through them in a sec. Um, but they represent each part of the company. Uh, we meet weekly for an hour, and it is viable in an hour to go through all offers going out. So I still read through every scorecard and every offer going out at Gusto, and that can be done in an hour uh, because it's brought together in a pretty condensed, consolidated way. Um, offer packets are prepared by the recruiter and by the hiring manager, and they're not done for hiring committee. It actually is because it's just good hygiene, right? If you're going to hire someone, you want to have a really thoughtful process around why you're going to fill that role. And then once that person joins, a lot of the materials you create for this hiring packet become a big part of the 30, 60, 90 day plan, become a big part of the onboarding experience for that person. So there is a lot of ways to repurpose it. And then the bulk of our time is spent looking at scorecards, um, pattern matching, seeing things that we see across them, what's working, not working. 
And the outcome is most offers are approved. We do tend to um, ask for deeper dives on you know, somewhere between 3 to 5% of offers. That can lead to additional interview or conversation or sometimes an offer not being made. And then we give those uh, pieces of feedback to the hiring manager as well. And so this is a makeup of hiring committee at Gusto today. Um, we have the CEO team represented. I help facilitate. We have foundation, which is people in finance, biz, which is our go-to-market and CX functions, and then um, EPD, which is focused on engineering product design. Um, some examples of stuff we discuss, I'll point out one here in particular. Um, if there was a no on a scorecard, we want to make sure that uh, the hiring panel was brought together, there was a discussion around that, the specific no was addressed perhaps in a subsequent interview, um, but the person needs to have reconciled and actually be okay with making an offer, otherwise the process was not followed correctly. And so, um, yeah, just to summarize, we have gone through you know, three examples. Um, there are a million more, and hiring, recruiting is not just one specific topic, but hopefully they've been useful to you on some of the lessons from Gusto, ways that we've thought about it. We're always trying to get better, improve, uh, and I'm always thinking about the way we can make these programs better as we grow. Um, summary concept, hiring is all about alignment, um, making sure you find alignment around, in our case, these three dimensions, values, motivation, skill, and you have to keep iterating the way you do that. It's a two-way process. You're always going to have them choosing you as much as you are choosing them, which is an important philosophy. And uh, definitely, offers are celebratory. You know, cheer, celebrate, get excited. I mean, definitely when they accept, that's even more exciting. But getting to that point where you found someone who you really think could be a great part of your team is an incredible moment worth um, acknowledging. And uh, if you go back to that tip I made at the beginning, um, whether it was for these programs or other programs, uh, spend the time, try to codify what practice, what core element needs to stay the same regardless of size. Make a, make a practice around that, make sure other folks own it so it's not just all on you. And then I think with that mindset, you can have hiring be the same uh, at 550, 500, 5,000. That's definitely our goal and I hope it's your goal as well because people uh, is what it's all about. Um, thank you for letting me speak with you. If you have any questions, send me a note. This is my Twitter handle and email address. Thank you very much.